Welcome everyone, and uh, it's lovely to have you here for this first webinar in uh, Workwell's four transport webinar series. I'm Graham Cowan, and um, beside me on our screen is Meryl Stibbett. And uh, Meryl's from Workwell, and um, we're going to ask you to uh, you know, put in any questions you might have, whether it's about some of the content I cover, or some of the more specific stuff about Workwell and WorkSafe, uh, please put that in the, um, in the Q&A box. Let me just uh, launch my screen. So, uh, it's, it's a very, very appropriate time to be talking about mental health in the workplace because haven't we had some challenges? And I'd like to do a big uh, call out to the transport industry because you've really been one of the unsung heroes of this whole COVID-19 crisis. There's been lots of talk about the healthcare workers and they certainly deserve that credit, but not many people really appreciate um, the sacrifices that you in the transport industry, whether it's buses or trains or trucks, have gone through. So thank you very much for from me. As I said, um, these, this series is brought to you by Workwell and the Workwell Toolkit. And this is uh, a whole bunch of resources to help you create a mentally healthy workplace. And as I mentioned, um, you know, Meryl will be here at the end to, to describe how to use it or any specific questions you might have about what we're doing. So what we're going to be covering today is why a mentally healthy workplace is important, how we promote mental health in the workplace, what work-related factors impact our mental health, our joint mental health, talking about some work well resources that could help you and, and some are you OK resources. The webinar will finish um, in 30 minutes time, right at 1.30, but we'll also take time, to, if there's still questions there, we'll, we'll stay on for as long as people want to ask questions because we want you to have the most value possible. As I mentioned, I'm Graham Cowan, and how I became so passionate about this area is I was working in a senior leadership position when there was a previous market crash and I crashed and burned. I went through five years of uh, depression, not working. And so I truly appreciate, you know, the, the elements around mental health, what's it like to be injured, what it's like to be rehabilitated, but more importantly about how we prevent this, how we prevent it happening in the first place. Because the closest thing we have to a mentally healthy workplace is prevention and early detection. That's the closest thing to a silver bullet. We often think about resilience as important, but I really believe that the, at the core of it is care and self-care for ourselves, self and, and team care that leads to resilience and ultimately growth. I wrote uh, a series of books in the Back from the Brink um, book series. And through that, I met Gavin Larkin in 2009 and worked with him and a small team to launch Are You OK? And it's just been incredibly rewarding to see how that's grown. I think we've learned a lot about the important messages that come from that and all, want to weave a bit of that into what we talk about today as well. So it'd be great to get your input straight away. So what's the biggest challenge you're currently facing due to the COVID-19 crisis? And I'm just going to launch a poll which will allow you to vote on screen. So in front of you, you can um, just write in there what, what, is, what is affecting you most. Just uh, choose one of those options and uh, we'll just let got the poll running, got the poll running and we'll end the poll now. And yeah, this is interesting. <laughs> this is really interesting. So I'll share the results. So you'll see there that um, neck and neck is the uncertainty and not being able to separate my personal and work life. And I think, I think that really nails it. And, um, you know, in Victoria, uh, there's been the unfortunate circumstance of a, you know, a few new cases. And I think that's really thrown a lot of people. But uh, one of the things we have to do is to focus on what we can control. 
So I'll just stop sharing the results and we will move on. So why mental health? And, and I, I must add that um, these figures relate to normal times and there's plenty of anecdotal evidence to show that there's been a spike in mental health issues since COVID-19. There's been increased usages, for example, of Beyond Blue um, uh, Lifeline services and, uh, and many anecdotal that when I've um, spoken with many, many industries and what have you. And as you can see there, 45% of us will experience a mental health condition in our lifetime. And this PwC research showed that for every dollar spent on promoting positive mental health, it delivers a return on investment of $2.30. And there's not many things that provide a 230% return on investment. It is good for business. I'm gonna talk more about this, but um, when I ask people, and I, I do seminars and workshops in the normal world, in, in the real world, and I ask people about their best team they've been in, and always they describe teams that uh, care about each other, have each other's back, uh, have a common purpose, enjoy themselves. So good mental health is good for business, and we'll discuss more about that. One in five Australians will experience a mental health condition any one year, and I'm one of those one in five. You know, I've, I've had some real struggles myself and have to be hyper vigilant about early warning signs. And the cost is huge. Um, you know, WorkSafe Victoria found that $86,000 is the average cost of a claim. It's a big number. And so getting that under control really helps you in terms of helping reduce your premiums as well. And uh, for those with a mental health injury, you know, it can take a long time. You know, you can see there in six months, only 54% return to work. And uh, two years later, only 38%. So, um, you know, when people are on claim, it's hard and it's difficult. And, I, and I, as I said, I was out of work for five years, so I really speak with first-hand experience about this. And th this research by Beyond Blue shows that employees expect it and value it. 91% uh, think that it's really important, and only 52% believe that work, their workplace is mentally healthy. And in the research I've done around the transport industry, I know that there's lots of challenges there. Lots of people, you know, drivers or train drivers um, are working remotely or often have sedentary lives. So there are lots of challenges and we need to work together and have a, a shared approach to make progress in this area. Because I, I truly believe that the number one priority for managers these days is to build a caring and resilient team who enjoy growing together. And this CSIRO research shows that it's a rising issue. They've identified rising work stress and mental health issues as a top six megatrend for the next 20 years. And this was before COVID-19 and the massive change that that's brought on. Um, so what do we do? There's multiple approaches. And if you start on the right hand side of your slide, they're in the tertiary area. This is where we fix people up after they fall over. You know, after they have an incident, we you know, suggest they see their doctor, what have you. And that's a slow and difficult place and a very expensive place to be. The secondary category of improving mental health is around, uh, you know, learning prevention strategies. So resilience, uh, mindfulness, um, good life strategies is all part of that. And what's probably not really focused on too much is this very important area of primary or prevention or systems approach. And Professor Anthony Lamantonia from um, Victoria identified these three approaches to building mental health and was able to really identify, he reviewed 400 peer review studies and identified that this prevention approach is the best for companies and the best for employees, not surprisingly. So it's about removing or reducing work-related risk. So what are the risks? What are the things that can either increase or bring under control mental health in the workplace? So you can read the factors there, and there's quite a few of them. Low job control, high and low job demands, poor support, poor workplace relationships, 
low role clarity, poor organizational change, low recognition and reward, and poor organizational justice, poor environmental conditions, remote and isolated work, and violent or tra traumatic events. And we're going to be touching on a few of these in this four part uh, series. We're going to be talking next about how we reduce fatigue. But we're also going to be touching, I think, in a, a later session about how we reduce trauma. And uh, what you should know is that uh, you've automatically signed up for, um, by signing up for the first one, you'll also have the chance to participate in the future ones. Now, it can get a bit overwhelming when you see those 11 things. You think, what do I categorise or focus on first? And what I, as I mentioned before, I work in a lot of live workshops and I ask people to reflect on what's the best team they've been in. And, you know, they think about it a bit and then I ask them to nominate one or two words and we get things like um, had each other's back. Um, we had a purpose. We, uh, we um, had complementary strengths. We enjoyed ourselves. And then I ask them, would you, did you care about each other? Did you care about each other? And absolutely everyone raised their hand. And this is, you know, a lot of the key to getting things right. And having a caring culture, you know, does mean that you think about things like job control, about job clarity, around um, communication, about uh, recognising progress. And so I want to just now talk about some of these important elements to build great teams. So many of those factors that I just talked about before can be summarised as poor support or quite frankly, poor care, because if we care, we provide support. It's as simple as that. And uh, what I think is really fascinating, we think about, talk about culture and the importance of culture and team culture and team performance. But at the core of culture, where it is derived from is the Latin word cultus, which means to care. And uh, if we can provide this culture of care, it does lead to extraordinary things. And this isn't just anecdotal. This has been proven by one of the leading uh, measures of, of discretionary effort or employee engagement. And specifically, the Gallup organisation, they've been researching employee engagement for over 50 years. They've tried hundreds of different questions. They now have it down to just four, uh, sorry, just 12 questions or statements. But the one statement which has been shown to be the best predictor of uh, engagement, profit, productivity, is a positive answer to this. My supervisor or someone at work seems to care about me as a person. And they have shown, they've asked this question in over 13 million times in 135 countries, they can overwhelmingly show that the more people that strongly agree with that statement, the higher the profit, productivity, customer service levels, and employee longevity. So uh, just a reminder, if you've had any um, thoughts or questions on anything that's come up so far, please uh, just write it into the Q&A box right there. We um, are going to be finishing, I guess, the formal part of the presentation in probably about uh, 10 minutes time. So, um, you know, please, uh, if there's anything that's come up or you want any further clarity, either myself or uh, Meryl from um, Workwell will be able to answer that. So what did the leader do? <laughs> well, you know, the first thing is to apply self-care and to walk the talk. You know, as you can see from this um, American Psychological Association study, if a leader supports the program, there are massive benefits to the team and to the organisation generally. You know, big increase in employee motivation, job satisfaction, positive relationships. So you as managers and leaders, the most productive thing you can do is to practice self-care. Make sure you're getting enough exercise yourself, making sure you're having good rest, making sure you're eating well. And uh, it's remarkable that if you do that, that flows onto your team. They see your example. And in many cases, I've seen where there's been a senior leader which has started to put these self-care practices into action, it flows onto the team. I've seen, you know, a, a manager in a very senior bank, um, you know, decide to go for a run every lunchtime. And that led to his whole team 
or most of his team practicing more self-care, not necessarily a run, but doing something for their well-being. So well-being, mood is contagious. I want to really try and simplify things. And I think um, a really significant book that I've read recently is called The Culture Code. And what it looks is at all the high-performing cultures around the world. And so it looks at um, the Navy SEALs, it looks at Pixar, it looks at particular um, manufacturing companies, it looks at Google, it looks at um, organisations that are really, really outperforming. And it goes through all these examples, but then it just really simplifies things. And what they said, and I think this is a, a great thing for us all to keep in mind, future ready leaders always ask themselves these three questions. Do we feel connected? Do we feel safe? And do we have a shared future? And uh, I'm going to be talking about each of these three things and just think about, and I know there are some challenges in transport, you know, when people can often be dispersed and I'm not making light of that. Um, but what I am suggesting is that if you ask your team about how we can do this better and listen, truly listen to the responses, I really believe that you can put together plans that work in any industry. This was a survey that we did for, um, for Are You OK last year. So this was before the COVID-19 crisis and before lockdown. But as you can see, almost one in four employees don't believe that anything is done to connect them, connect them with their workmates. And this is a really, really big issue. And it's not <laughs> complicated things that, that uh, contribute to that connection. You know, we asked people what was their favourite thing to do. As you can see there, there are things like after work drinks, coffee runs to the local cafe, lunch in the office, morning tea, lunch out of the office. And I know that some of these things are challenged by, um, you know, the transport industry and the disparity of people. But really ask how you can do that. Like I, I know of... Um, you know, one small transport company that takes the boss, uh, takes off, uh, allows the workers off to have one day a quarter where they do something special together. You know, sometimes they go to do a paintball thing or go to a park and have touch footy and lunch. Um, but there are creative ways to do that. And the investment made there will, will pay itself many, many times over. So safety, we're talking about connection and safety. And uh, of course, we often think of the importance of physical safety. But now, very, very rapidly, psychological safety and team safety has been shown to be the most important thing. And what is it about a psychologically safe team? Well, the first thing is they feel comfortable being themselves. They can be themselves. The second thing is they can take moderate risks to make improvements in how they how they work with each other, how they try to improve customer service. They can make those things, try those things, and know that they won't be sacrificed if things go wrong. And this is, you know, there was a, a big study done by Google, and they sought to understand what was it that made up their best teams. They call it Project Aristotle. And what they found was that after looking at 186 teams around the world at 280 different factors for each of those teams, they concluded that team psychological safety was the most important thing. Because if you get that right, you can have discussions around clarity of role. If you get that right, you can have discussions about dependability. If you get that right, you can have discussions around meaning and, 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 and the future. The final question is, you know, do we have a shared future? And this is really about thinking about your organization's uh, vision and mission and values and inviting people, inviting the team to be part of that. And as you're facing daily questions in this COVID-19 crisis, to really consider, you know, what we can do to make our customers' life easier, our life easier in the next couple of weeks. And we really do have to work in really short timeframes these, these days. So, just reminding people, this is, this is our mission is to deliver better value to our, to our customers. How can we do that? How can we keep evolving what we do and uh, which will make it better for all of us, quite frankly. 
And I couldn't uh, finish by talking about the importance of um, Are You OK? You know, as I mentioned, I was involved right in the beginning and I'm a current board director. And uh, it's just wonderful to see that now 90% of the Australian population knows what Are You OK? is. But we're on a mission to really take this from Are You OK? Day to Are You OK? 365. We really believe that is where the true potential lies. We also have um, specific resources. I'm sure many of the people in the rail industry would be aware of this. We have specific resources for the, um, uh, the rail uh, industry, which has been organised by TrackSafe, and also for the motor trades industry and general ones as well. The other big area is remote and isolated work. As I said, we can't cover everything today, but um, there are a lot of remote and isolated workers in the transport industry. And it's important to make good communication systems available if they are working remotely, to really understand where they are and where they're going and when they're returning, encouraging social connection. We see coming back to this connection. So how can you encourage connection with your remote teams? And uh, there's got to be ways you can think about doing that. And if anyone... Uh, you know, has got a way to connect with their remote team, just put it in the chat box. We'd love to be able to read that out. And finally, <clears throat> if you're concerned to, of course, ask, ask, are you okay? Because that shows you care. And as we've seen before, creating a culture of care has massive benefits to the business. <clears throat> so this work, work World Toolkit um, is a voluntary tool. So it's anonymous when you sign in. You have the chance to do a diagnosis for your organisation. You can choose by industry, uh, by number of employees, and then choose what are the particular areas that you're most interested in and you think are most relevant. We're now going to show a, a, a short video which will give you an overview of um, how we tap into these resources that help us build a more mentally healthy workplace. Meet WorkSafe's WorkWell Toolkit, a tailored free online resource helping employers to create mentally healthy workplaces. Sign up and explore your custom dashboard with case studies, videos and other useful resources that you can begin to action straight away with your team. Use a step-by-step -step approach and track each action. Then share the progress with your colleagues. The topics include role clarity, leadership, change management and so many more. Creating a safe and mentally healthy workplace is good for your employees and your business. Discover the WorkWell Toolkit today. So I know, uh, having worked with lots of small business operators, that they're often carrying so many and juggling so many balls. But this allows you to log into something and uh, have all the different factors in one place. It's a really, really helpful um, resource and if you have any questions about that please put that in the in the Q&A section um, you know for example these are areas that relate to here role clarity working alone culture how do we improve culture and there's bits on each of these areas you know some succinct information not just work safe Victoria they've also put in their other resources from around Australia um, which they think are really helpful and essentially it's you know the standard approach understand the problem talk to people Bounce off a few things around, give it a try, did it work, and let's check in and see if we can improve. This is how psychologically safe teams work. This is how connected teams work. This is how teams that feel safe work together. And you can find this at that URL, uh, but you can also just find if you, if you just uh, Google work well, you'll find that you'll find this area as well. And uh, of course, there are the Are You OK at Work resources. You know, there's posters there, there's whole lots of resources for different industries. As I said, we do have specific ones for rail as well as for the motor trades industry. And as I mentioned, this is the first in a four webinar series. Uh, next one, we're going to be talking about how we reduce the risk of fatigue. And uh, fatigue is a massive issue in the transport industry. We know that. And there's figures that confirm that. We're going to be understand how we can um, improve and manage the risk of trauma. And uh, as many of you know, very tragic things happen to train drivers. They see horrible things, so do truck drivers. So we're going to be talking about some processes there. And thirdly, how to improve and manage your subcontractors and subcontractors' mental health. So uh, we're 
we're through as we expected. We're at 124 and um, we're ready to answer any questions you might have now. I might, might just ask Meryl to come back on again to turn on your screen. There's Meryl again. And uh, Jenny's there to uh, curate the questions. Um, so do we have any, you just notice you've got your uh, mic off, Meryl. There we go. <laughs> um, Jenny, we've got any uh, questions that you'd like to ask? There are a couple of questions, Graham. Uh, to summarise a few of them, which are sort of in the same category, can you talk a bit more about how a leader creates a great team? Yeah, it's, um, you know, I, I think initially it is about trying to get to know each other better. And um, it's a funny thing to say, but, you know, having informal get-togethers like, you know, uh, lunches or picnics, we're going to the cafe or even something completely outside the thing it allows people to get to know each other better. When they do get to know each other better and feel comfortable with being themselves, it's then really thinking about how do we build that safety? How do we build that psychological safety in our team? And we build psychological safety by not saying we can't do that. We say, well, let's try this. And if it doesn't work out, we say, well, what have we learned from this? How do we have a learning mindset to continually improve ourselves? And, and the next element is to really reinforce to people about the purpose and strategy of our organisation. And purpose is so important when we're going through very tumultuous times. One of the greatest exponents of that is a guy called Viktor Frankl. Uh, he went through the concentration camps in Germany and he wrote a book based on that experience when only one in 29 survive called Man's Search for Meaning. And that's what he found was the, the unique element was that those that have a sense of purpose about why they're doing what they're doing, the benefit they provide to others, they were the ones that survived. So, you know, it is about getting to know each other, being connected, being safe and, and really having a shared future together. Okay. The next question says that um, the, they don't have a lot of face-to-face -face contact in their team. So in that sort of circumstance, how do you specifically show that you care? Yeah, it's a great question. It's not just, uh, it's relevant for all uh, industries at the moment as well. We've had, um, you know, never before have so many people worked from home and remotely. And I've, I've heard lots of different examples about how teams do this. And, you know, for example, having, having a, um, a, a trivia night, you know, working at a trivia night, a virtual trivia night, you know, virtual drinks on a Friday afternoon, um, uh, crazy shirt competitions <laughs> and part, party shirt competitions. So all those things, I guess, provide a sense of, of purpose and connection. I've also heard managers talk about how uh, they've gone to a colleague's or a, a teammate's place and, um, you know, gone for a walk with them, you know, socially dis distance is appropriate. So that, improves connection, but also the support and what's expected. Uh, in, in the transport industry, I've heard of, um, you know, truck drivers, you know, knowing who's on the road at certain times and where they're going and what state so that they can call each other, connect that way. Uh, so there's some examples. Okay, some questions now about the WorkWell toolkit. So if somebody is just going to jump on and um, has not used it before, what sort of things would they find the most useful? So a question for Meryl. Yeah, uh, so there's lots of useful resources and tools that the team has compiled from lots of reputable sources. One of those is the Are You OK website. Uh, we've looked at Beyond Blue and several other really well-known organisations to put together a suite of resources in basically a one-stop shop um, where an employer can log on and have access to. And uh, the resources we try as much as possible to tailor to uh, the individual business's needs. So you'll get resources that are unique and instructions that are unique to your business size and for several industries as well, transport being one of them. Uh, and they, they, there's about, oh, for the transport industry specifically, when you log on and create an account, you'll have access to up to 40 different actions related to several different important topics um, related to workplace mental health and all of these actions are broken down into really uh, easy to follow step-by-step -step, small um, well-paced practical uh, pieces that will help you work through and create a mentally healthy workplace. 
Meryl, what have you found has been used most of all the all the things on there? What's been used most? Yeah, so in terms of the uh, most common actions we find uh, or the most popular actions we find people uh, looking at, um, prevention of bullying and respectful workplaces, they're, they're some of our most popular actions that uh, people look to access on the toolkit. And they, you know, once again, confirm the importance of creating that culture of care, don't they? You know, if we have a culture of care, we don't have bullying, we don't have disrespect. So uh, that's right. Any other questions? Um, there are. So next question, does WorkSafe Victoria have a strategy to inform employers about the value of mental health? So specifically about measuring employees' engagement and their dedication to it? Uh, in terms of a strategy, we oh, we have been working on a strategy. I think work's still going uh, for a in, uh, for a work safe wide strategy and how we engage with employers. At the moment, externally, we do this by providing uh, relevant guidance materials that employers can access from our website. There there are guidance materials related to bullying in the workplace to work-related stress and, and lots more. Uh, we've got a dedicated website where you can access those materials. Uh, and obviously the WorkWell program and the WorkWell toolkit is a really big way in which we engage with employers in terms of creating the importance of mental health and creating mentally healthy workplaces. Okay, here's another question for Graham. So, um, and I think many people might find this relevant. What sort of strategies do you have for leaders who may be resistant to supporting mental health wellbeing campaigns? Yeah, that's an incredibly important question because, you know, I think the traditional management approach was command and control and which was very successful when we were producing widgets, but no one's producing widgets anymore. And now we need a workforce that is um, able to change directions pretty quickly and to really build on that. And as I said, I, I truly believe that the number one priority for a manager or business owner is to build more caring and resilient teams who enjoy growing together. So increasingly, we are seeing the benefits, and these are you know, quantitative benefits of having mentally healthy workplaces. And I really believe that you know, this whole crisis has crystallised this issue and we're going to be seeing much greater focus in this area because quite frankly if we don't get this right there's going to be huge costs to our economy and huge costs to our society so it's sharing the benefits but it's also you know it's it's, it's the carrot but the stick is you know you are legally obligated to have a mentally healthy workplace you know I'll give one example one extreme example telecom um, France managed a restructure so badly that it led to 19 suicides and that led to six people on the executive team including the ceo going to the criminal court so that's an extreme example but you are legally obligated but more more importantly it's a much better place to work if we are a team that focuses equally on care and performance humanity and productivity you know that is where the best and most sustainable results come from Okay, another question for Meryl. So the WorkWell Toolkit, how many sort of actions are in it and how long does it take to complete? Sure. Uh, so I, I mentioned before that when you create, uh, for example, an account and you've selected the transport industry as your industry, you'll be led to a dashboard of up to about 40 different actions. Um, they're related to several different uh, workplace mental health related topics. Uh, we cover the work-related factors that Graham was talking about previously. And there's no necessarily set time limit as to how long each of those actions take. It'll really be dependent on what your priority areas are within your business. So you have the flexibility to choose the order in which you work through the actions. And it'll be about how much time you dedicated to each one, uh, how much time you dedicate to each one but it really breaks it down. Each action is really broken down into a step-by-step, -step, really easy to follow, practical kind of uh, way of approaching each uh, focus area. That's it for questions. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, everyone. We've gone a little bit over. We've gone to four minutes past um, the 1.30 mark, but thank you for joining us. 
during this very busy time. Thank you for wanting to make mental health a priority in your organisation. And I really hope you join us on our webinar next week, next Thursday, which is going to be specifically around how we reduce fatigue, how we look at it from an organisational perspective uh, and how we manage it. Bye for now and uh, look, hopefully catch up with you next week.